Some time ago, when I was looking for some old hardware or software, from time to time I came across a system called PC98. I had no idea what the is, I thought it's an ordinary PC, but made by NEC for Japanese market. While it was made by NEC, and it was made for Japanese market, it was far cry from ordinary. When I looked more into it, I found out it's not what it seems to be and I got intrigued. So I went online, started searching and ended up with all of this stuff. This video is about how I got familiar with the system, what it is, what it does and is it or was it worth it. First, let's have a gander at how the system was born. The PC-98 was made by NEC in Japan and it wasn't their first home computer. Its latest iteration was called the PC-9821, before that it was the PC-9801, before that it was the PC-8801, before that it was the PC-8801 and the first in line was the TK-80. There was also the PC-6001 which was sort of a cheap version of the PC-8001. The TK80, TK meaning training kit, was developed by NEC in Japan in 1976. It was based on Intel's 8080 CPU clone processor, developed in-house by NEC and was made of course for Japanese market for a reasonable price. NEC was aiming mainly for enthusiasts to help Japanese learn how to use computers. It was just a simple PCB with 25 keys and a couple of LCDs. This PCB could be hooked up to a monitor, a full-fledged keyboard and a cassette player, or more like a cassette loader. Even though it was hugely successful, a lot more than for instance Apple or Commodore, it lacked speeds and functions which led to an expansion kit, TK80BS, with more RAM and basic interpreter. But the kit still wasn't enough to satisfy customers and it forced NEC to develop a newer and better computer, the PC8000 series. Unlike the TK80, the PC801 was essentially a personal computer. This time it was based on Xilog Z80 clone, made again by NEC. It was 1979 and the PC801 was the first NEC's attempt to produce an 8-bit personal computer. Unlike the TK80 or some other computers which were sold to end users unassembled and the users had to assemble them themselves, the PC801 was a complete package containing a keyboard and a motherboard ready to be hooked up to a monitor. The PC801 wasn't the first such machine on the Japanese market, there were two other computers before that, Hitachi's Basic Master and Sharp's MZ80K. Even though the PC-801 came after, it was much cheaper and much more successful, it was controlling 40% of the PC market in Japan at the time. Not so much around the world though, well, it was pretty much non-existent outside of Japan. Even though it was sold in Europe and North America, it never got popular or widespread. There were two minor upgrades, Mark II and Mark II SR, only small changes were made such as edit memory or better graphics mode, which allowed playing better video games. In 1981 came out the PC-8801, it was more of an upgrade than a new line. NEC used the same CPU which was upgraded in later models from 4MHz to 8 and added some more memory. These were just minor upgrades, what was however changed quite a bit was the chassis. NEC had separated the keyboard from the computer itself, so in later models they could stuff in for instance floppy drives or even CD drive. There were about 30 models of the PC-88 series and the production ended in 1989. The system was so popular, it was still being developed alongside newer and much better PC-9801. The first model of the PC-9801 came out in 1982 and it was NEC's first 16-bit home computer. NEC tried to market the system for a business use, but Japanese had other idea how to use the computer and in the end it was largely used as a gaming system with tons of games released for it. It featured Intel 8086 CPU running at 5 MHz, 128 KB of RAM and video card supporting 648x400 in 8 colors. Then NEC started releasing model after model, about 5 millions of them, each model with different CPU or different amount of memory, larger hard drive, different floppy drive or different sound card featuring FM synthesis for instance. The final model was called BX4 and it was released in 1995. Mine is called BX3 and was one of the latest models featuring Intel 486SX running at 33MHz. 
This specific unit was upgraded to 486 Overdrive DX4, running at 100 MHz and 32 MB of RAM. It was much more popular than the competition, specifically FM Towns from Fujitsu, X68000 from Sharp and of course IBM, all of which were a lot pricier. NEC controlled about 60% of the market and the rest was split between Sharp, Fujitsu and IBM. The first PC9821 model was released at the end of 1992. It was called S1 and featured Intel 386SX 20 MHz. The PC9821 line added standard PCI slots, DIMM memory and CD drives, pretty much natural evolution of every Intel-based system. On the flip side, one quite important feature has been removed, at least from a BX3 model, a reset switch. Not sure why NEC removed it, the PC9801 had it and it was always rather useful. During my testing the computer stopped responding, froze or locked up many times and old control delete didn't work, so I had to turn it off and on again every time. Unnecessary strain on the components and myself. Again, NEC had released shit ton of models, each model with different CPU or memory or hard drive, etc. The last model was released sometime around the year 2000 and was replaced by PC98 and X that was PC compatible and meant pretty much the end of the PC98 system. I've got all these models, all of them are working fine, so it would make more sense to review the PC8000 series first, but I don't have external floppy drives and a cassette loader, so I've decided to review the PC98 first. What's quite strange about the PC98 is, well, everything. It uses Intel x86 CPUs, it uses Microsoft operating systems such as MS-DOS or Windows, however, it's not compatible with IBM computers, at least to some extent. At first glance, it looks like an ordinary IBM desktop PC. There's a floppy drive, CD drive, an Intel CPU, DIMM or SIM slot, IDE PETA connectors, PCI slots, etc. But then there's this riser card, which is a bit different than its IBM PC equivalent. These are some of the expansion cards for the system, which are slid here into these skids or rails. There are two types of proprietary slots in there, they look like this next to each other. This one is for a 32-bit local bus slot, which was introduced with the PC9821 and it's something like a PCI in IBM world, and this one is for a 16-bit so-called C bus, meaning compatible bus, which is something like an ISA. Even though it looks almost the same as the IBM PC inside and out, it works a bit differently in terms of memory and input-output port addressing. Take for instance CBUS sound card. The situation is very similar to ISA sound card, where the computer needs to provide IRQ, DMA and input-output port. The CBUS version just provides a different address and port unknown to the ISA. It's similar for PCI and local bus. Since PCI has no central DMA controller, PCI sound cards don't produce sound in DOS games because they need DMA to work. So you won't get sound in DOS games from local bus sound cards either. That being said, what is quite important in any computer, at least for me, is a sound card. I've got a couple of them, even two of the most famous sound cards ever, at least in the IBM world that is. The Sound Blaster 16 and R32 are easy to install and they're working in pretty much any system for the IBM PC. Here, it's a dumpster fire. First, I wanted to install the R32 in Windows 98. The installation CD contains only drivers for Windows 95 though, so I was hoping Windows has some driver for it, but I was sorely mistaken. Since there are no drivers for Windows 98, either from Creative or Microsoft, I used the drivers from the installation CD for Windows 95. Unfortunately, the whole system froze and couldn't be started ever again. Then after I restored the system from a backup image, I tried installing drivers for IBM PC Windows 98. It sort of worked. It worked for MIDI and FM synth, but I couldn't get the sound working. In the end, I was forced to install the bloody card in Windows 95, where it worked just fine. Thank you. 
Then I wanted to get the card working under DOS naturally. The installation CD doesn't include any DOS driver, so I found some driver for Sound Blaster 16, which on the IBM PC works for all 32 as well, at least some later releases. Unfortunately, the driver didn't want to detect the bloody card, and that was pretty much the end of it. Since I've got the driver, I tried using the Sound Blaster 16, and it worked perfectly fine. Well, perfectly fine is a bit of an overstatement. You see, on the IBM PC, the Sound Blaster 16 or All32 is a golden standard. You can play almost any DOS game with sound and music. As I found out here, the All32 doesn't work under DOS at all, and while the Sound Blaster 16 works, it works only in Western games. I tried tons of Japanese games and none of them worked, neither the sound nor music. Moreover, not even all Western games work, so if you're planning for whatever reason to get a PC-98, getting any Sound Blaster is a bad idea and a waste of money. Just get a proper NEC sound card, it works in every game. I've collected some interesting CBOS cards over the years, such as these. They can be used together with any sound card, these for MIDI, of course, and a sound card for sound. Speaking of MIDI, not too many games for the PC-98 use MIDI. Vast majority of games use just FM synth for some reason, unlike games for the IBM PC which use mainly MIDI for music. And that makes me wonder what bits of the computer can be replaced by a standard hardware from the IBM PC. Such as CPUs, memory, CD drives, hard drives or PCI cards, can they be used interchangeably in both systems? Let's try it with a memory first then. The PC-9821 came with a single 32MB DIMM memory module, so I tried putting it in the IBM PC slot and it didn't work. To be sure I tried it in my second test rig and it was exactly the same. Now let's take some ordinary memory and try it in the PC-98. After numerous tries, I found out it's not really keen on memory upgrades, at least using standard DIMM modules, EDO, SDRAM or different voltage. Whatever memory module I stick in there, it registers only one fourth of the actual capacity. It's a bit weird, maybe it really needs an actual NEC memory. So this test failed miserably. A CPU on the flip side was working like a charm in both the PC-98 and the IBM PC. I tried switching it for a couple of Pentiums ranging from 100MHz to 233 and all of them were working fine. I've got some PCI cards made for the PC-98, so let's stick them into a normal IBM PC. The first one is a 3DFX Voodoo Rush. The rig seems to be starting normally, Windows has detected the card, so I've chosen a reference 3DFX driver. And the card is working perfectly fine. The second card is an NEC Power VR, again perfect working order. So it seems like the IBM PC has no problem with PCI cards taken out from the PC-98, as long as it's got drivers of course, but is it true vice versa? The PC-98 BIOS and drivers are limited to certain hardware, so if I take for instance Voodoo 2 card made for the IBM PC, it works perfectly, cause there were Voodoo 2 cards for the PC-98 and there are Windows drivers. PCI devices, check. 
If you ever want to buy a PC98, you can use pretty much any better hard drive. You don't need to spend tons of money on a hard drive that was made specifically for the PC98. The hard drive just may need to be initialized with the disk in its program first, and then it can be used normally. So hard drives, check. When I took off the PC9821 cover, I found out there's only one ID connector for each channel, and I was wondering if it's to save space, or if it's gonna work the same way as the IBM PC does. Master, slave, you know. So, I've took an ordinary ID cable with two connectors, and connected two drives to it. The computer detected both drives, and they were working like a charm. On both channels, that is. So, yeah, works pretty much the same way as the IBM PC does. Another check. CD drives on the flip side can be a bit of a problem. There's no universal driver for DOS that would initialize any CD drive as you've got for the IBM PC. So if you've got a rig without a CD drive or your original CD drive broke down or something, you may need to look for a compatible drive if you're planning to use DOS that is. The same goes for floppy drives. I tried replacing the one that came with the rig with all of these and none of them worked, even NEC made. It apparently needs some special NEC model, or models. The connectors for mouse and keyboard are proprietary, so you either need original stuff such as these, or there are some adapters for PS2 or USB. Speaking of keyboards, I've got this one. As you can see, it's made by NEC. Generally, pressing the keys feels very good. Not as good as my trusty keytronic though. Also, there are some, let's say, difficulties you may encounter coming from an IBM PC. At first glance, the layout looks very similar, but at second glance, you notice lots of differences. Probably the most important key for a Westerner is this one, where the control key should be. It says Kana and switches between Japanese Kana and Latin input. Enfer and Exfer keys, or whatever it should be pronounced, are also used for Japanese input. This stop key is placed very poorly. I keep pressing it all the time instead of escape. It's either for terminating execution in BASIC or it behaves like a control break in DOS and Windows. The stop key is much heavier to press than the rest of the keys. I reckon they did it to not to press it accidentally. The copy key is virtually a print screen. This ohm slash CLR key works as a normal ohm key in Windows and DOS and clear screen in BASIC. Opus end key in Windows and DOS. In BASIC it shows error position in a program and it's used to enter BIOS by holding it during startup. Unlike IBM, NEC kept their system copyrighted and thus didn't allow other companies to produce or clone it. Until 1987, when Epson released their first PC9801 clones, which were supposedly better in terms of features and performance. To get to a BIOS, you need to hold the help key on your keyboard while turning on the computer. It's of course in Japanese. There's not too many options in there, it looks a bit empty compared to a BIOS for an IBM PC. Moreover, it's not called BIOS, it's called software dip switches. Since older NEC computers used actual DIP switches, they apparently wanted to keep some sort of virtual or perceived compatibility. You can even see the DIP switches changing down on the screen when changing some of the options. What I couldn't find in the BIOS though was any sort of option to change a boot order. PC98 work a bit differently in this regard than IBM PCs. First, a CD boot is not a thing here, so we've got only two options, a floppy or hard drive. If you've got a bootable floppy in a drive, it boots first. If not, it boots from a hard drive. But what if there are more hard drives in the system? Well, when I had two hard drives in, one with DOS, the other with Windows 98, it gave me a choice which one I want to boot from. If both hard drives had Windows 98 installed, it gave me a choice as well. But if one of the hard drives had Windows 95 installed, screw you and I'm loading Windows 95 no matter what. I just couldn't figure out how to boot from the other hard drive when one of them had Windows 95 on it. For someone who's come from the IBM PC world, this is sort of a new territory, even though it's got a regular Intel x86 CPU and MS-DOS. The system works similarly, of course, but there are some major differences. The difference you can feel right away is that the computer starts up lightning fast. It's much faster than the IBM PC startup. After it boots into DOS, you notice there's something wrong with the command prompt, specifically the backslash. Instead of the backslash, there's a yen symbol. It's a bit weird and takes a bit of a time to adjust to. Another difference is, well, everything's in Japanese. Back in the 80s and 90s, you either had to be able to read Japanese or you had to use trial and error approach. 
Nowadays, if you can't read Japanese, it's much easier with online translation programs for mobile phones. My Japanese is a bit rusty, and even though I can read hiragana and katakana, vast majority of Chinese characters are above my pay grade, but I found some partially translated command com, which can help a bit messing about with the system. The biggest, weirdest and also the most important difference is the two systems, however similar, are not compatible due to some hardware differences. You may be able to run some software for IBM PC and vice versa, if you're lucky, but don't expect it to be working. I, for instance, wasn't able to run anything I tried. That being said, one of the most important bits of IBM DOS, at least for me, is any type of two-panel file commander, such as Volkov or Norton or whatever commander you can find. It's a pain to work or do whatever without one of these. They are absolute necessity and unfortunately, they're what's missing on the PC-98. Well, I found some file managers, but they're all rubbish. I was so desperate I tried running various IBM DOS commanders, hoping at least one of them will work somehow, at least partially, but it was apparently useless. Now I'm stuck with a simple command line, or this, which was as close to Volkov as I could find. There are tons of games for the PC-98 or 88, but not too many Western games made it to the system. There are big games like Doom, Ultima, System Shock, Warcraft, Descent or Syndicate, but you won't find about 95% of the rest of the games here. Vast majority of Japanese DOS games are of course manga or anime based, to some extent, and lots of them are hentai, even games that seem like a normal game at first. Japanese just have to stuff some lady bits in pretty much everything. What you may find weird as well coming from IBM DOS is that most of the games can boot from a proprietary floppy diskette to run the game. The diskette usually contains necessary DOS files and some game executable, so you don't need DOS installed at all or you don't need a hard drive for the matter. Since the bloody PC-90 doesn't support CD boot, you need a Windows boot floppy or simply copy the CD content to a hard drive and run the setup from there. The rest is quite straightforward. It looks exactly the same as normal Windows 98, but everything's in Japanese. After the installation, I was trying to install and run various programs for IBM Windows 98, and all of them worked properly, except for 3D Marks for some reason. They were crashing all the time. Of course I had to try some games, like Unreal, which was horribly slow in software mode, so I tried to install better video card, such as this Voodoo Rush. The card is made for the PC-98 and it's got a driver only for Windows 95 and it works perfectly fine in Windows 95 as well as Windows 98. The Rush being a 3DFX card can run any game using Glide and Direct3D7, I reckon, and OpenGL, but that's quite limited. And that brings me to my DirectX version test. I wanted to know what's the latest version of DirectX that can be installed here. Then I tried putting the Voodoo Rush in an IBM PC and it was working perfectly fine with generic 3DFX driver. Then I got an idea. Does the generic driver for the IBM PC work on the PC-98? Long story short, it doesn't. Let me digress a bit to the hardware setup. This particular model has an onboard VGA card. When you insert, for instance, the Metrox card it came with, which doesn't have any video connector, it redirects video signal to the onboard output, so you can switch between onboard VGA and Metrox whenever needed. When I put the Voodoo Rush in though, which has its own output connector, it works a bit differently. IBM PCs have an option BIOS if you prefer onboard VGA card or PCI or whatever. Unfortunately, it's not here. So when I connected my monitor to the Voodoo and turned the rig on, it didn't display anything. 
I had to connect a monitor to the onboard card, install a driver in Windows and then it starts working. So when a monitor is connected to the Voodoo, it doesn't display anything until Windows loads up the Voodoo driver. So if you want to see the boot and then Windows, you have to swap a VJ connector back and forth. The Voodoo rush is horribly slow, partly due to lack of memory, but I've got something that should work a bit better. The Voodoo 2 If you thought I would try SLI, think again. This dim slot is very cleverly positioned, so it's in the way, which means I'm stuck with just one Voodoo 2. The graphics is faster, of course, however, the lack of memory and slow CPU is still very much present. Quake is running fine at 800x600, but Unreal and Unreal Tournament are literally unplayable. I wanted to know how my PC98 compares to an IBM PC with exactly the same hardware. So I dug out this motherboard with Intel VX chipset, 32MB of RAM, the same CPU of course, and the same VGA card. The results are quite interesting. I ran some benchmarks, namely Quake, Unreal and Unreal Tournament on both systems and in terms of graphics it was pretty much on par give or take. What however wasn't on par was overall system performance. While the IBM PC was snappy and running like a stallion for what there is, the PC98 was like a limping donkey compared to its IBM counterpart, either during the installation or during startup or just any operation really. Everything took too long to finish, a boot was about 3 times slower even though I'm using the same hard drive. It's again partly due to the lack of memory, it wouldn't go amiss to have at least at least 64 megabyte, but when I tried using ordinary memory, it either didn't work at all or it just registered less memory than it should. The motherboard has got also SIM slots, but none of my SIM modules worked. Sound Blaster all 32 works as it should in Windows, as you can hear, but unfortunately no sounds or music in DOS. Networking works exactly the same as well, I can connect to and from the rig as I would on an ordinary PC. Internet is also working perfectly fine, until you get some virus that is. The problem was, when I restarted the rig, it stopped working and I couldn't make it work ever again. Horrible screensavers and wallpapers are the same as well. Literally nobody in the entire world has ever used any of these, I reckon. Aside from DOS and Windows, PC98 can run BASIC, OS2 or PCUX, which was NEC's port of Unix System 3 made specifically for the PC98. I couldn't find it anywhere on the interwebs, so I couldn't test it, obviously. FreeBSD has also its own port called FreeBSD98, surprisingly. The prices for vintage hardware are quite high nowadays, but fortunately there are some emulators which work rather well. Three major ones are Neko Project 2, NX86 or ANX86, I don't know, and DOSBox X. NX86 and Neko Project 2's sole purpose is emulating the PC98. Then there's the DOSBox X which is mainly for the IBM PC DOS, but it can emulate the PC98 as well. Game library is quite large and interesting, there are excellent games you've probably never seen or even heard of. The problem is Japanese language, its writing system is not very friendly. There are some games translated to English, so you may enjoy at least some of them if you can't read Japanese.
some games had some problem with graphics on my PC 9821, such as Nightlife. The game's quite fun, but this takes out of the fun part quite a lot. So, is the PC 98 worth getting? Well, yes, if you are some sort of collector or you want to play Japanese hentai games using actual hardware, they can't be played on a regular PC, some of which are pretty good to be honest. There are of course some emulators I've talked about, so if you're not too keen on using actual hardware playing Japanese DOS games, then no, it's not worth getting at all. It's bloody pricey nowadays, all of these cost about 2000 quid, there are not too many western games, which are useless anyway if you can't read Japanese, that being said, the entire system is in Japanese, Windows is bloody slow, and if the hardware breaks down, it's gonna cost an arm and a leg for a replacement bit. Was it worth getting back in 80s and 90s? Again, the only reason would be Japanese games not released for the IBM PC. It was popular in Japan mainly for its ability to use Japanese keyboard and all the software and games were in Japanese. Hardware was limited, software was limited and when IBM PCs gained the ability to use Japanese software and keyboard, the PC-98 became obsolete and eventually went to top. And there you have it, the PC-98 is quite an interesting piece of history which deserves to be preserved and nurtured if you've got one. And if you want to get one, go and try some emulator first, so you won't regret buying the hardware. See you next time, cheers!